Okay, well, let, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the Huntsman Cancer Institute uh, breakout regional session. My name is Deborah Shelton. I'm the executive director of the ACPMP Research Foundation. Um, the ACPMP Research Foundation is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to fund educational and awareness programs um, for appendix cancer and pseudomyxoma peritonei, and also very importantly to fund research um, for additional therapies for ACPMP with our ultimate goal to find a cure for this disease for all. Um, a little bit about me, just very briefly. I've got over 25 years experience as a food and drug lawyer with a focus on drug development and medical device development. Do a lot in the patient advocacy space. I have a strong uh, affinity for rare diseases, always have. And lo and behold, I found my way to the ACPMP Research Foundation after my spouse was diagnosed with appendix cancer in 2018. And I've been serving as a volunteer since, most recently as a volunteer executive director. Very happy to be co-moderating this, the Q&A portion of this session with Dr. Laura Lambert. Dr. Lambert is a professor of surgery and director of the peritoneal malignancy program at the University of Utah. She specializes in the care of patients requiring surgical treatment related to peritoneal carcinomatosis, which is cancer which is spread throughout the lining of the abdominal cavity. And, and she also specializes in gastrointestinal oncology. Her main clinical focus is the surgical management of peritoneal carcinomatosis and the use of HIPAC. She has published and spoken extensively on HIPAC as well as the surgeon's role in comprehensive palliative care. And so with that, Dr. Lambert, it's really my, my privilege to be co-moderating the session with you. And let me just turn the mic over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Deborah. And thank you again to the ACPMP Research Foundation for sponsoring this important uh, event. It's been a great morning. <laughs> uh, a lot of information, um, a lot of uh, exciting research that's going on and uh, just uh, great speakers and great questions from uh, the uh, participants as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had 40 people registered and I was, so I'm hoping that more people will come and join us as, as the afternoon, as the hour wears on. Um, I think right now we actually have more <laughs> sort of panelists on the, on the list than, than we actually do have participants. So I'm just gonna take a minute to introduce uh, the people who are with us from the Huntsman Cancer Institute. We have Dr. Doug Rogers, who's um, <clears throat> one of our radiologists here. And I just have to uh, give a shout out to him. He is the only radiologist who has ever reached out to me while following up about a patient who had an abnormal appendix that he was just wanted to get a second opinion on and was concerned that that person might not be heading in the right direction in terms of their care. So that was a huge theme of what we talked about this morning is getting people to the right uh, providers who understand the disease process. And so I was just very impressed uh, with that. And so I invited him to join our panel. And also on the list, we have Joan uh, Elizondo, who's one of our uh, dietitian, registered dietitians here. Uh, she works with Emily Pree, who was on the uh, symposium earlier today. We also have um, the Reverend John Cooper, who's one of our chaplains here, who uh, has been instrumental in helping our patients as we were talking about um, earlier, the, just the challenges that people face after going through the surgery, uh, the whole journey with cancer, uh, and he's just a, uh, an amazing resource for us here at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. We also have uh, Junko Fowles, who's with us. Uh, she's one of our financial counselors. We know that oftentimes people facing this type of surgery and treatment can experience a lot of financial hardship as well. And also running into the issues that come up with insurance, especially getting insurance to cover a rare disease and a, a sort of outrageous treatment uh, so she's been incredibly helpful in helping us navigate that part of the process as well. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Kaisa Affelter, who's one of our pathologists, our GI pathologist here, who has just really 
been sort of my go-to person um, with every sort of patient that gets referred. We uh, routinely have their pathology specimens reviewed here by our pathologists and, uh, you know, has really kind of taken this on and understands the nomenclature, understands the changes that are happening, uh, knows what she's looking for. And so I really trust her uh, diagnoses uh, from the pathologic standpoint and really look to her for guidance in, in helping decide what next best steps to take once somebody's diagnosed with appendix cancer. So, so thank you, Kaisa, for all your support. Um, this uh, part of the uh, symposium is always my favorite part. Uh, so when I was at the University of Massachusetts prior to coming out to the Huntsman Cancer Institute, uh, we had a number seven, actually, of these symposia um, over the course of the time that I was there, sponsored by the ACPMP. And as part of the program, we always um, invited a patient and somebody who's been a special part of their journey uh, to present their, their story, their, um, what they've experienced, what they've learned, what's important to them, and just kind of let them uh, tell us about uh, you know, what, they, what they have experienced. And today, we actually, we actually have a really special uh, two presenters. Um, so we have Mr. Mark Griffin, um, who uh, I'll let you tell, I'll let him tell uh, his story, but he is uh, a patient that I've had the privilege to take care of here at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And Trisha Quinn, who has been a very special part of his journey and has her own story as a long, long-term survivor uh, from PMP and a HIPEC uh, 30 years ago. And she's going to share her story as well from both perspectives, having been a patient and having been a, been a caregiver. And so <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, um, <clears throat> to Mark and Tricia. And afterwards, I hope again, like I said, we'll have more people come and there'll be opportunities to follow up on any questions that may have not gotten answered in the uh, morning session or if new questions come up, please, we'll, we'll open it up for, for questions. So we're gonna keep this pretty informal and, um, uh, and just sort of see where it goes. So Mark or Tricia, do you wanna take it away? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll start. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm, uh, I'm Mark Griffin. I'm located here in Utah. I came across a um, a lump on my uh, abdomen, just above my navel, uh, that was uh, diagnosed first as an inguinal uh, hernia, some sort of a hernia, uh, by a general practitioner. And um, it, he suggested that I wait, and I um, didn't go along with that. I, I said, no, why don't we just get this thing out and discover what it is? On, uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, I got a pathology back from a a surgeon that removed this mass uh, from my abdomen and it, it turned out to be a malignancy. Um, and from then on, I, ha I have to say it was this, it was one of these symposiums. Uh, I started initial cancer treatment and other things. I wasn't really satisfied with what I was seeing. Uh, not that the doctors weren't trying hard, but I just didn't feel uh, that adequate treatment was uh, being forecast, of course, chemo was recommended and, and other things, but I, I just didn't uh, feel adequately that, that things were being discovered. So uh, I, I went all over the internet and finally found a symposium just like this that Dr. Lambert was in. And I noted she was up at the Huntsman uh, Center, which was close by, very fortunate for me. And I uh, emailed her, gave her all of the pathology results of the surgery said, I think this is what you specialize in. Like to know what kind of course of treatment she responded immediately. I think it was the next morning, which is by my experience, unusual for doctors to respond quickly. Thank you, Dr. Lambert, uh, for that. And, uh, we got together, I think a few days later, uh, and it turned out to be what we thought it was. Uh, she recommended a course of, uh, treatment, uh, some chemo that was involved. I think I went through six sessions of chemo. Um, it reduced the size of the two masses that remained. We found, I think, three uh, CT scan. Um, and I, Dr. Lambert, you interrupt me if I'm getting any of this wrong, but uh, uh, didn't know exactly because we couldn't 
we couldn't really biopsy. There was initial, uh, I think, laparoscopy uh, that, that took place. One mass we knew was probably the same as the one that was removed. The second one uh, didn't really know, but knew where its location was. So we waited until the chemo had reduced it to size. Uh, that was that was good. And Dr. Lambert made the judgment call to remove it. That was, uh, or remove both of them. That was August 24th. Uh, so I'm still in the three month recovery period. Uh, you have your up days and your down days, but I'm starting to feel pretty good. Uh, and I think the latest pathology said there was no cancer in my system. Uh, very happy about that. Very happy about the treatment. It is, uh, I, I tell people who ask me and, and we talk about it because they're very concerned that I had a cancer diagnosis and I tell them that it turned out fairly well and it left me with a, a scar that Sinbad would envy. Um, and so <laughs> I'm happy about that too. I have something to talk about. Uh, so I don't know what, what else I, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, about it, but one of the things in that happened that was unusual in my instance is I've known Trisha Quinn for 44 years. Uh, we, we served, uh, in a service capacity about 44 years ago and I met her and we recently reconnected and I was surprised, uh, to find out that I think 32 years ago, Trisha, you had this very same surgery in an experimental capacity because you were much more seriously ill at the time. And, um, I'm not sure I'm getting that right, but maybe you could take over from my nervousness here and you could explain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. that would be okay, great. Um, yes. In 1989, I suffered the same, a uh, very similar problem that Mark has. And so they did experimental surgery at that time, plus the high pack. And it was a difficult recovery because it was a little bit longer, more expensive surgery. But um, I'm here today, very healthy. I hike, play with my grandkids, uh, raise my own children, and very grateful for this surgery and the difference it's made in my life. I would add that one of the things that was, and I came to Dr. Lambert about this uh, and offered my services to do the same thing that Trisha's done for me. She's, she's been a companion in every single meeting. She has translated for me uh, some, of the, some of the medical things and told me what to expect. It was very helpful having somebody that's been through this process before to, to guide me and to, and to help me. And to tell me, take your pain medication, quit fooling around, Mark. <laughs> so anyway, uh, she's, she's been good to keep me on track. And I think that's a big benefit to have at least a contact with somebody who's been through this procedure before to let a, a new patient know what to expect and that the doctors are serious about what they say. So, uh, Mark, was there anything that I guess... Um surprised you um that you weren't prepared for that or maybe i don't know uh, or just caught you caught you off guard at all about the surgery or the recovery or um i i would say that uh you know i i i kind of pride myself in being a physically fit individual and it is it is a serious surgery. Uh, and it, I, when I was told it's going to take three months recovery, I thought, well, okay, I'll give it a month uh, and I'll be back in shape. But uh, Trish has been one to say, no, you need to lie down once in a while, take it easy because you've had major surgery. Uh, and that's been helpful. Um, and it's, and she was right. It's going to take the full three months. And I think it'll even take a little bit longer to recover full digestive uh, normality, um, and, and other things, but I've been very, I've been very pleased. I was able to, I was able to walk. Um, I thought after a surgery like this, I'd be down for a while, but I immediately, the hospital got me up and walking around and that was important. Uh, I won, I got the one mile certificate. I did laps around. I think, I think it was great. I think, uh, uh, Chaplain Cooper, I think you came in and talked to me too, 
uh, I was amazed at uh, the, the help that it was to, to have the hospital personnel help me. I wasn't really say actually the, the most surprising thing, I think, uh, Dr. Lambert was when I got the, the green light on the, the removal of the cancer. Uh, I really expected that it would be a longer process and it may return. I don't know, but I, we're going to monitor it carefully. But I was very pleased with that. Um, and very, I think I understood very well what the process was. Um, but it did take me because I guess of uh, arrogance and pride to think that I could handle this better than, uh, better than most people and I recover sooner. But I think it's, it is a slow process. Patricia was good at telling me that it's going to take time. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I tell everybody who's facing the surgery that it, the recovery is a lesson in patience. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and everybody thinks that they're, that they should recover faster than they do. And, you know, so we try to remind people that, uh, it's, you know, surgery knocks the wind out of your sails, chemotherapy, as you know, or anybody who's had it knocks the wind out of your sails. And when you put the two and two together, um, as I always say, they don't equal four, but, you know, it kind of equals eight. Uh, and it, it just takes long. It just takes longer, you know, just the surgery alone, you might recover in about four to six weeks. But when you add the chemotherapy, it really is a good six to eight to 12 weeks, depending on how much surgery you have to have at the time of surgery that that certainly impacts things. Plus, um, how fit the person is coming into the surgery. And, you know, you were in very good shape for the surgery. So that definitely played a role in your recovery. Um, that has been, you know, good so far and, and has, you know, kind of keeping you ahead of the curve, uh, even though it may not feel like that it wasn't ahead of you, maybe not ahead of your curve, your personal curve, but <laughs> keeping you ahead of the general curve. So that's, yeah. yeah. So, and uh, Tricia, so 1989, um, the first HIPEC was done in 1980. So that tells you really how sort of early in the HIPEC history that you had your surgery. So it is truly, it truly was experimental at that time. And it's, it's truly remarkable uh, how well you've done and, you know, just kudos to your surgeon and, uh, and to you for, for seeking that out and, and, and going through that. Um, in any, can, do you have any, uh, observations or comments or thoughts about the difference or the, the role of being a caregiver? And would, if you have any advice for anybody who might be supporting somebody going through this, I know you had the unique perspective of having been through it yourself. Um, so maybe that is actually something that you could share with us as well. Right. Uh, thank you for being a caregiver the most important is probably what you mentioned, patience, and just being able to keep the patient on the pain pills uh, those first three months to make sure that the body has no pain. So then you can eat, the person can eat, and be able to feel like they're recovering. So patience is a huge thing, and just soft foods, um, very gentle diet, and calling you a lot. <laughs> we called you a lot just to make sure everything was normal. And you were very gracious and always um, very solicitous in the care too. Thank you, yeah. No, I think that's a, a huge part of it, right, too, is being able to, um, to ask if something is normal, right? And it, and it may be, right? It just may be normal for, you know, this part of, you know, the time after surgery. And, um, and these are the sorts of things that we expect to see. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, we also, if you're worried about something, we want to know, because if it is something more serious, we want to get you in and, and check things out sooner rather than later, right before they get. So we don't, we never mind getting the phone calls. We'd rather know uh, earlier rather than, than waiting. So great. Well, good. I, I would say from a from a patient standpoint, one of the things that, that Trisha was very good at helping me out on was uh, after I think about after the 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 third day or the fourth day I can't remember I was I think I was still in the ICU, um, but or maybe just out of it, but kind of the the opportunity for for diet opened up uh, I could I could eat things, but I didn't realize and Trisha was good at helping me to understand this that 
soft foods are better and some foods are not going to digest as well. And so you have to take note when you, you have a dietary intake of some sort of food and it doesn't play well with you, you should remember that uh, and only take a little bit of that in the future. You're going to have the same reaction. So uh, it's a matter of easing back into normality uh, as far as diet is concerned and other things, even though the, the doors are thrown open and you can pretty well eat what you want, mm -hmm. but it's, it comes at a price when you eat the wrong stuff. So yeah. I don't know any other way to put it, but no, you're absolutely right. And I might ask Joan uh, to weigh in here. So one of the things, um, you know, that is actually unique to um, surgery with the high pec afterwards that, you know, there's a, there's a big push in general surgery, uh, more straightforward, you know, abdominal surgery to really start feeding people earlier. It's, you know, it's better for the gut. The, the, the best way, the best way for us to get nutrition is through the gut. And the best thing for the gut is to get nutrition through the gut as well. Um, that being said, when you, you know, what I always tell people is anytime we operate on the abdomen and we do anything with the intestines, um, they, they tend to go to sleep for a little while. We call this an ileus. Uh, we expect it. Normally our bowels are moving in a very coordinated fashion. So that things go down and out in the right way. And when you operate on the intestines, they stop moving for a day or two. And then, and we expect that, but when you add the HIPEC or the heated chemotherapy on top of that, um, then, uh, the, um, the bowels go to sleep for a little bit longer. That ileus lasts a little bit longer. And the other thing that, that I've certainly seen in over the years that I've been doing this is that when people try to eat after HIPEC more so than any other surgery, they just feel full really quickly. And, uh, and also you've had chemotherapy, so food may not taste normally. And, um, and so you're right, even though, you know, we, you know, we, we advance people's diet more slowly after the HIPEC, um, and we do it gradually liquids to more thick liquids to solid food. And then we do say there's, there's no restrictions. I mean, there really aren't, um, but it does take a while for the system to get going again, uh, for the stomach to regain the capacity that it had. And there are certain foods that are, that are not going to fare as well. So the things that I advise against right away are red meat, because it tends to sit very heavy in the stomach. And if you have that, you may not eat for another two days. Um, you may not feel like eating. And then, you know, the raw fruit with skin on it and the raw vegetables. Um, Joan, do you have any other comments from the dietitian standpoint? <laughs> yeah. So thanks for that question. Um, I feel that obviously we all know that nutrition is really important, especially after that big major surgery. Um, and, you know, we always want to kind of focus on trying to get adequate protein, trying to get in all those calories that we can. But, you know, as everybody mentioned, you know, your body kind of had trauma, right? And now it's kind of trying to figure out, oh, okay, I need to kind of learn how to do this again. So that's why we start it really slow. Um, you know, you might want to try some like protein drinks. There, there are some clear liquid protein drinks that sometimes are a little bit easier to digest and or other types of protein drinks. And then just really soft foods that are gonna digest easily go through, through the system. And I think in the chat, someone had wrote about a food diary. Um, I like the food diaries. Um, I usually try to recommend if you think about it, you know, maybe writing down what you eat and then maybe on the side, if something happened, like, oh, I had a lot of bloating or I had, you know, cramping or diarrhea or whatever happened, you might want to keep a little list so you can remember. Because I know if I ask people, the hardest question I ask people is, what did you eat yesterday? <laughs> or they really have to think about it. So sometimes writing that down just to remember, you know, and then also, you know, what side effect did I have? Um, but really trying to focus on that protein, um, softer proteins, like you mentioned, like maybe, you know, like fish, maybe like some yogurt, um, those types of, 
of foods and um, just taking it slow. You know, as Mark mentioned, you know, like, ah, one month I'll be fine. You know, I've, <laughs> I've done through surgeries. It's easy peasy. Um, but I mean, it really is um, really hard on your body and getting that nutrition will help your progression of recovery a lot quicker than if you're not eating or you're like, I'm nauseous, so I'm not going to eat. So I think it's important to also um, have that dietitian come in um, when you're recovering and trying to work with you to figure out what foods are working, what foods aren't. Um, but yeah, really starting soft and you might need to do those soft foods for four to six weeks and then start slowly, you know, like even like half cup of like, okay, let me try, you know, half an apple. Let me see how that goes. And just incorporating kind of like you would a baby, just one food at a time and just seeing how that goes and then taking it day by day. And, um, you know, eventually things are going to be great, but you have to take those baby steps and then, you know, then you hit the top and then you can do a little dance <laughs> once you've recovered. And, um, but yeah, it does take a while and you do need that extra nutrition to help get you over. And um, I can't emphasize enough the need for protein after a surgery like this. So, um, you know, protein is the glue that holds us together. And as the body's recovering, it's demanding a lot of protein to uh, heal the wounds uh, that have been made. And uh, so, so we really emphasize that. And I always tell people it's exactly the opposite of what you think should, you should eat soft, white, and bland. <laughs> so we all think about yeah. the, you know, the brown and the, uh, you know, the whole grain and stuff like that, but right after surgery, it's soft, white, and bland. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Lambert, you also mentioned uh, vitamin B. Is that for restoration of nerves or I looked into that a little bit of, I've, I've been trying to do that and it seems to have helped. Yeah, um, it certainly can be uh, helpful for that. You know, people who have had their right colon removed, um, the terminal ileum, the last part of the intestine is where vitamin B12 is absorbed. Um, most people do fine without supplements, but it is something to keep an eye on uh, when you, especially if somebody, if you've had a, a larger portion of that very end part of the small intestine uh, removed, then it's something to, to be aware of. And you can have that level checked periodically and, and replace it as needed, but it, it certainly can't hurt to, um, uh, to replace it. And that, that was a question that came up uh, earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, so I, I, we, we do have, uh, some more participants, uh, on, and I'm wondering if anybody, I'd like to open it up to, uh, questions. Otherwise, I mean, I can uh, kind of follow up on some of the topics that, that came up uh, during the, the morning session. And, and Deborah and I have uh, some questions that are probably still left over. But um, does it, do any of the participants have questions? Thank you, Tricia and Mark, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Pleasure. While we're waiting to see if anybody does have a question, I'd love to give if anybody was on this session last year, you may remember that um, the guest patient that we had speak was a young man who was 13 years old at the time. Um, and I just want to report that he is now 14 years old. He's a freshman in high school and he's doing very well. He went uh, hiking with his Boy Scout troop this summer and uh, it's just kind of gained all the weight back that he had lost through all his treatment and uh, is doing very well at this point in time. So I just wanted to share that with anybody who was on the, on the symposium last year. And um, Dr. Lambert, just to kind of piggyback, I think in terms of questions I'm looking, I don't see the question and answer box open, but I think the questions could be submitted through the chat box. I know we've got one comment through chat, just reiterating the importance or value that a particular patient found with keeping a food diary and helping to kind of see one food at a time, what worked well and what didn't. Mm -hmm. um, while we wait for questions, just I had one that we got back previously from some patients, which I think is, is really an interesting question. And hopefully we get, can get some perspective from Mark, you know, and Trisha and others, but how can 
someone, a friend, family member who lives some distance from a patient and their family support them throughout their diagnosis and surgery and after, after treatment? Like, even though there's a lot of geographical distance, do people have thoughts on, on things that um, someone could do to be supportive long distance? I think a, a lot of phone calls would be nice if the patient is up to it, especially if they're, you know, family or close friends. Uh, encouragement through cards, um, even flowers, maybe if the person likes it, or balloons, just a lot of encouragement to let them know that the pain will subside eventually and they'll be able to eat and feel better at time. Yeah, I think even now, especially like with texts and stuff like that, like you can text somebody, but don't necessarily expect them to reply. And if they get your text, it, I think that's gotta be, you know, somebody's thinking of me and, and kind of a pickup, you know, even if they can't really reply in the moment, but just sometimes, especially early, you know, a phone call might be a little too much, like Tricia said, um, you know, but just a text to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. And, um, you know, that that kind of thing, I think, would is, is very helpful. So I, and, and I know it was I, I have a kind of a semi large family and, and at least uh, three quarters of them live uh, at a at a fair distance. And I know when I was reporting, they're interested in progress. And as a, as a patient, I would tell them how I'm progressing and what's going on and probably a little bit too much detail <laughs> that they didn't want to hear. Um, but it was always helpful to me when I would report some progress, they would report back, great, you know, we've got you in our, in our prayers, we're thinking about you, uh, and, and it's great that this is happening, that, that you're progressing along and what you recently reported were we see as very, very positive. And that always helps. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just a text or something else, it doesn't have to be a phone call. Mm -hmm. But that kind of verbal support, even if it's printed, is, is very useful because you're doing a lot of laying around and wondering what you ought to eat next. <laughs> <laughs> so. Great. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat. I think I'm going to throw this to Dr. Garrido. I'm going to introduce Dr. Ignacio Garrido Laguna, who's one of our medical oncologists. Um, and uh, he, the question is about recurrences and prognosis. And the question is, would having more than one recurrence, even after a successful CRS and HIPEC, reduce life expectancy? And also, is the risk of further recurrences higher with each recurrence? I was mute. Hi, Laura. Hi, Dr. Rito. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I think the question is uh, whether the risk of relapse is higher, which is subsequent recurrence, and the answer is yes, right? So um, the, the role of chemotherapy in this disease uh, in patients who have uh, invasive adenocarcinoma, it's clear. We basically approach these patients very similar to how we treat uh, colorectal cancer when they have intestinal histology. And uh, unfortunately, because we don't have good trials, because this, uh, there's not good randomized trials, we don't have definitive evidence. So a lot of the evidence that we have comes from single institution studies, from retrospective studies, looking at the national cancer uh, database. But uh, the paradigm is that we approach the disease very similar to how we treat colorectal. Now, um, I, I think it's important to also look at uh, what we have to offer in these patients that have already progressed to chemotherapy, multiple lines of chemotherapy, and at some point we get to a point where we don't have any more uh, fall fox or fiddy or some of these standard care options to, to do. And we favor uh, trying to understand the disease biology, trying to do uh, genomic testing, we do know that a number of these patients with uh, appendiceal tumors are gonna have mutations in, in some genes that um, uh, might be opportunities for us for treatment. Uh, things like KRAS, which you may have heard, right? It's mutated in 50% of uh, patients with this disease. 
And although uh, we have traditionally considered this as an undragable gene or protein, we don't have drugs targeting. We have a number of drugs coming now uh, down the pipeline that actually have activity against certain KRAS mutations. And some other drugs that do not necessarily target RAS, but target some other proteins of the, of the pathway, like SHIP2 inhibitors. And uh, finally, there's a, a new trial that we're opening at Hansman with a drug that basically uh, it's uh, targeting patients who have a mutation in a gene called FBXW7, which is a gene that it's involved in the, in the um, uh, cycle, in the division of the cancer cells, how rapidly those cells uh, proliferate, right? So for patients who have exhausted chemotherapy, we do have um, clinical trials uh, available. And going back to the question, yes, with increased number of relapses, increased risks that we will see a, a relapse, right, down the road. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Garrido. Um, Deborah, if it's okay, if we don't have any other, I will take any questions that come in the chat, but I was kind of thinking of maybe going through, um, again, some of the questions that were left over from the morning session that we didn't have a chance to get to, especially since we've got such a great panel uh, of people here. And so I thought I would, um, if it's okay with you, I'll start with Dr. Rogers. So Dr. Rogers, we had a, a lecture this morning um, about the different roles of um, CT scan, MRI, PET scan uh, for um, surveillance and diagnosis. And I uh, wondered if you could just, um, you know, particularly with around the mucinous tumors, uh, you know, a lot of people ask about the role of the PET scan and whether MRI or CT scan is better for detecting peritoneal based recurrence and just, you know, I, I know I didn't, I didn't give you a heads up on this question, but I thought I'd just get your thoughts off the top of your head on, on the different modalities. <laughs> yeah, so I just think when you're comparing these modalities, it's really important to have the perspective that all of them uh, have limited sensitivity compared to surgery. Um, so you can say, well, this one's better than that one, but at the end of the day, uh, the most definitive uh, staging is going to be the surgical staging. Um, CT is definitely the workhorse. And I would say CT has one major advantage over MRI, and that is that it acquires the scan very quickly, whereas MRI can take minutes to acquire uh, an image. And so when you have things that are moving, so bowel tends to peristalse, um, CT captures that very quickly and can show you very accurately uh, what's happening whereas MRI sometimes struggles with that. Um, and also, you know, I, I think there are some studies out there that show that MRI may show peritoneal disease a little bit better than CT. Um, and I think that is true, but it's important to also remember that if the patient moves just a little bit, uh, it's gonna become very difficult to see what's going on. So there are some pluses and, and minuses there. Um, PET, does increase sensitivity for disease. That's definitely true. Um, but, you know, again, after surgery, I would say not everything that's pet bright is disease. So that's the other thing to remember. And so once you've had treatment, especially the closer you are to treatment, things that are bright are less likely to actually represent tumors. So, uh, you know, you just have to kind of play it by ear there. I think where MRI plays the biggest role is when you see a lesion and you want to know what it is, and I think for liver lesions, this is probably the most important place because benign liver lesions are extremely common. And so CT may detect a liver lesion, which I think is an important type of metastasis to find in appendiceal cancer. And it may not be able to tell you exactly what it is. Whereas if you get an MRI, it may have features that are actually definitively diagnostic of a benign lesion and something you can you know, kind of not worry about. So that's definitely where we use that the most. So at the end of the day, CT still remains, you know, the, the, workhorse. Uh, the workhorse here for sure. Follow up question to that though, um, is, you know, people are worried about if they're, particularly if they're young and this tends to be a slow growing disease and we follow people out to 10, even sometimes further out, um, radiation uh, from CT scans over that time period. What, what are your concerns as a radiologist? Sure. Yeah, so that is the downside of CT, right? It has ionizing radiation. 
Um, there's not, uh, you know, really, really excellent data where we can say your risk of developing this cancer uh, <laughs> after this many CT scans is this. Uh, so that doesn't exist. It's sort of a theoretical construct, especially in adults. There's a little bit of a data around kids who get, uh, very young kids who get a lot of CT scans, maybe their risk for things like leukemia is a little bit higher, but in adults, it's, it's basically theoretical. Um, so CT scans, the truth is the amount of radiation you get from a CT scan depends on the person um, and the body part that you're scanning, but a reasonable number that's thrown around is 10 millisieverts is the amount of radiation you get. And that's something like the amount of background radiation you would get just from living your life, you know, just uh, you get from cosmic radiation over about three years or so. So, yeah, I mean, I think in people who just get scan after scan after scan for year after year after year, a discussion could be had for going for MRI, uh, for, you know, following things up, especially if you're just getting you know, tens, twenties. I mean, you, you, that, that does add up. And so we do that for some patients. Um, I'm not aware of any guidelines around when to do that. Um, but I mean, I think MRI technically could be used uh, to look for disease in a surveillance setting in certain patients. Great, thank you. Well, it's good to know that there's no like, at, you know, above, above this certain level of CT scans, we're definitely seeing it. I, it it's, it's interesting to know that that data does not exist because I know there are concerns about CT scans and stuff right. like that. So great. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Appleter. So um, we had a little bit of a discussion this morning about um, some pathology. You know, the importance of having um, appendiceal tumors and appendix appendices uh, evaluated uh, by an, an expert pathologist uh, to get the accurate diagnosis and. There was one paper that, that I actually presented that kind of looked at um, a, a more standardized processing of the appendix with serial sectioning uh, of the appendix to make sure we're not missing a lesion somewhere or a perforation that's not clinically relevant. Can you maybe just share your thoughts about like when you get a, when you get a, a specimen appendix, um, I know you guys all look at the the clinical record to see what the real question is, because uh, that doesn't always come through from the operating room. Uh, and I always see that clinical history. Um, what are the, some of the things that raise your antenna about this might be a tumor and do you do anything uh, special to process that specimen if you're worried that there might be uh, a cancer or tumor? Yeah, so, you know, we receive, a lot of appendices in the gross room, uh, the large majority of which are just an acute appendicitis. Um, I, I was always taught um, kind of the rule that if you have an acute appendicitis in someone over the age of 40, you should think twice that there might be something else causing it. Um, so that's kind of one of those red flags that makes me stop and take, take a second look. Um, standard sections is um, the, the margin section. So that's where someone like Dr. Lambert, Lambert cuts it off from the rest of the colon to make sure if there is a lesion that it was cut out completely. That's standardly put in no matter what the cause of the appendicitis is. We also do a random cross section in the middle and then we bisect the tip and always put that in. So if a case comes in and it's just an acute appendicitis in someone younger, because that's commonly they just get acute appendicitis, that's what we put in. But if they're older, if there's anything surgically or imaging wise that is funny, we put the whole thing through. Or if anything looks different or suspicious at all on those standard sections, we go back and put the whole thing through as well. The good thing about the appendix is it is relatively small. So if someone gets you know, their liver taken out, it's absolutely impractical to put the whole liver through and look at it. We would never get done with our day. We would never get through all the patient specimens in our day. Um, but with the appendix, we can put the whole thing through and look at it. So we have a pretty low threshold to do that. Um, 
it is really important to be looking for any sort of perforation that um, maybe the surgeon didn't see. So if the surgeon sees a perforation, that makes it easy. It was there. Um, but if not, then again, we would put the whole thing through and we can also look for, for levels. Um, the problem with these mucinous tumors is that they, they dilate the appendix so that they're big. And with that dilation um, comes a thinning of the wall and it can also kind of calcify and fibrose. And so that makes it not as flexible as it is in a normal appendix. Um, and so you can imagine that it might be intact in the body, but as we're grossing it, it can break um, or there can be a small perforation. Um, and so it does take careful analysis of the tissue. And there are some findings that we, we can see under the microscope with regards to what the, the actual mucin looks like um, that allows us to, to know with pretty good certainty um, whether or not it was releasing mucin, you know, in the patient's body, or if that was after it was resected, mm -hmm. um, that then the mucin got, you know, just kind of broke. And, and so it's, it's kind of, it's ex vivo mucin versus in vivo mucin, if you mm -hmm. will, inside the patient or outside. Mm -hmm. um, and that is important because that directly correlates with the stage that we give you for the appendix. Um, so if some of you guys have seen the path reports, you might notice that there's a T stage, a PT. It's like a PTIS, and it, there's, I won't dive into the minutiae, but it might jump to a PT3 or 4A or 4B. And there's a direct prognostic correlation with those higher stages. And PT4A is defined as essentially having um, broken and has have, having been releasing that mucin into the peritoneal cavity, into the abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that, I guess that's, that's the standard versus what makes us put the whole appendix through and then what we're looking for to try to stage appropriately and accurately so that, so that you guys all get um, the best treatment. Because really, if it's early stage, it has a, has a much better prognosis um, than the later stages. And Dr. Lambert can correct me, but, um, you know, these huge surgeries that you guys are having to deal with, I don't, I don't think you do them if they're an early stage tumor, right? If it's a PTIS or a PT1. Yep. yep. Then the appendectomy is curative, right? If right. it hasn't perforated, absolutely. And, yeah. um, so it's an and that, yeah, and that's, you know, that, that's the other, you know, that kind of came up in the conversation earlier today, actually somebody, so I'll answer this question. This was a question I was going to give to myself <laughs> if it came up, uh, was how do we educate surgeons uh, to, to be more thorough uh, when they take somebody to the operating room for acute appendicitis? And, um, you know, like, like you said, uh, Dr. Affelter, mo most of the time it really is just acute appendicitis and and surgeon just kind of gets in and, and takes the appendix out as quickly as possible. Um, so education around what the risk factors are, if you're operating on somebody who's a little bit older, um, you know, you really want to take that time. Uh, it, and it doesn't really take time. It, you know, you're, you're in there, it's one big open space. You run the camera around, you look at all the peritoneal surfaces. You can just quickly check and see if you see any mucin or anything that looks like it might be tumor outside of the appendix. And then, you know, you'd biopsy something if you saw it. Um, it really doesn't add really any time to, to the operation. But then, uh, you know, if it is one of these early stages, then if it's a low-grade mucinous neoplasm that has no risk of spreading to lymph nodes, and it's completely removed with the appendix, and there's no sign of perforation, you know, that, that person is essentially cured of that. And those are some of my, my best uh, clinic visits is when I get somebody referred to me for a second opinion about that um, because the general surgeon took an appendix out and this is what it had. And they weren't really sure how best to cancel, counsel uh, the patient. And I can't tell you how many times I, you know, I've had somebody come, uh, they've been told they have a cancer of the appendix. Uh, they're gonna need more surgery. This is really bad prognosis. And, you know, I look through the chart and I see, oh, it's a low-grade mucinous neoplasm. They had their appendix taken out. There was no perforation. You know, they're cured. 
and I walk into the room and tell them that, and and they look at me like I've got three heads in there, not sure who to who to trust at that point, right? Because they've just been told they've got they've got a death sentence, and and I'm telling them like you never have to worry about this again. And so um, that that's what makes this I think this particular disease of cancers and tumors of the appendix one of the more challenging ones that people can uh, find themselves dealing with because. There are very few people who really have a, a high volume of experience um, and, and can really tell you with confidence that, look, this is, you, you know, you are cured of this or no, this is more serious. This is what we need to do or somewhere in the middle of the road, right? And, and to be able to, to trust that person, how do you know, how do you know where to go and, and who to look for so, or who to look to? Um, so again, uh, as I said earlier in the day, really advocating for uh, you know, if you find yourself with this kind of diagnosis, getting to a high volume center that um, does HIPEC that sees a lot of tumors of the appendix for the whole spectrum and really understands the biology of the disease, has radiologists like Dr. Rogers, who knows what they're looking for, has pathologists like Dr. Affelter, who really knows what she's looking for, has medical oncologists like Dr. Garrido, who has seen this. It's not going to be the only, the second one they've ever seen in their career. Um, and then has a whole team, uh, you know, like with the dietitians who are very familiar with cancer nutrition, um, uh, like Reverend Cooper, who's very used to um, helping people on this journey that can be challenging in so many different ways. And also like Junko Falls, who's one of our financial counselors. And I want to get her to jump in here as well, um, because one of the challenges that people face, especially with um, HIPEC, where it can often be misunderstood as an experimental procedure at this time. Um, and she's helping people navigate their insurance and, and trying to figure, and like, that's the last thing that, that, that you need to worry about when you're, when you're dealing with a cancer like this. So Junko, I don't know if you can just kind of share some of your, um, you know, some of the experiences that you have when, when people come to you and the sort of the resources that you have and how you help them navigate. So what are the more, some of the more common problems that people run into and, and how you help them navigate those? Sure. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, to share, you know, what we do. And, and I really appreciate, you know, clinicians to always jump in and, you know, help with the peer-to-peer -peer appeals. It's always difficult to work with insurance companies nowadays it's compared to 15 20 years ago they're getting more strict more plans and you know lower reimbursement and we're always struggling to find with the payers of course and some of the things that we're seeing is you know our, our goal is to minimize patients financial distress so that they can focus on on the treatments not the financial debt so that's our ultimate goal and we're reaching out to more and more patients who are losing insurance or has insurance but cannot afford to pay a premium or cannot afford deductible co-pays. And now, you know, ready to proceed with the surgery, they're being told what well, authorization is pending and they'll be like, what does that even mean? Am I gonna get a surgery? So that's why we intervene and say, hey, you know what, we're gonna clear the surgery. Um, this is gonna go through. If it gets denied, we're going to find an appeal. And that's, unfortunately, that's what's happening. And like you said, insurance company, oftentimes they just don't understand um, the recent technology and, and new services. And I'm not a clinician either, but <laughs> that much I can tell. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm certainly seeing more and more peer-to-peer -peer reviews. And yep. uh, it is it is a challenge. But, you know, fortunately for this type this type of cancer, appendiceal cancer, there are now the Chicago consensus guide. So, so for those of you who are not aware, um, there's uh, something called the National uh, Cancer Network that puts together guidelines for, like, how we manage, how recommendations for how to manage, like, every cancer that people can get except, except cancer of the appendix, right? There's no guidelines in this national consortium uh, for, for, for cancers of the tumors of the appendix. And we recently participated with uh, Dr. Taraga, who was on the symposium earlier to put together national guidelines for the management of appendiceal cancer. And HIPEC is absolutely established part of that. So 
now, at least for this, this type of tumor, if we do get pushback from an insurer, we have guidelines to go to, we've got data to go to, it is no longer, should no longer be considered experimental for appendiceal cancer. Um, yeah, but so, you know, and I think, you know, one of the benefits that I've noticed or have appreciated since coming to the Huntsman Cancer Center is that everybody who works here, because it's a standalone cancer hospital, understands that the patients and their families, anybody who's coming here is dealing with cancer. Um, and that is sort of the mindset of everybody who works here, including like Junko and her colleagues. She understands that, like she said, she doesn't want you worried about the financial aspects of this. You don't need to be worried about that right now. You should be worrying about you know, just getting better and getting the best treatment that you can. And they take it very seriously here. And so Junko, I just wanna thank you and your staff um, for all the hard work you do behind the scenes to help us take care of the patients and offer them the best care that we can and, and try to relieve as much of that burden as possible. It's, it's a real real concern nowadays. And it's like you said, it's, it's only getting harder, unfortunately. So yeah, but thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat that I do wanna to get to, but then I do wanna um, give some time to Reverend Cooper because he has played an important part of our program as well here. Um, just quickly, uh, there was a question about fistulas. Um, so fistulas are abnormal connections from the bowel uh, to the abdominal wall and to the skin through which we often see stool draining. Uh, they are unfortunately a, a really known potential complication after cytoreduction and, and HIPEC. Again, you know, the HIPEC can impact wound healing and that can lead to that. Uh, the question is that if you get one, can there any, can anything be done about it? The answer is yes. Um, uh, most often we can get people's fist, a fistula fixed at some point, but it does take a lot of time. It often takes time with uh, giving people special nutrition through the IV, resting their bowels for a period of time, letting all the inflammation and infection settle down until it's safe to go back and do a, another surgery to fix it. Um, to, to finally fix that. There are some other um, evolving techniques to try to fix fistulas that sometimes work and sometimes don't, but fistulas can be incredibly discouraging, um, but most of the time we can get them fixed. But it, again, another lesson in, in patients and an unfortunate consequence of this surgery that, that can be very challenging and, and hard, to, hard to handle emotionally. So um, again, you wanna be with somebody who knows how to manage these and is going to be working with you through, you know, until it, until it's resolved. Uh, does officially preclude you from most clinical trials? Probably because most clinical trials require you um, to be taking adequate nutrition by mouth. Um, and it, it's going to set another, it's just going to complicate the, the water. So it might delay you from getting on a clinical trial and, um, uh, if you have fistulas or pressurized treatments, more dangerous. I don't, if you're talking about the, if the question's about PIPAC, I don't think they would offer PIPAC to somebody with a fistula because it would be very challenging. It could be detrimental to that clinical situation. And then the other question was, um, if tumor markers are elevated prior to HIPEC, is that a good tool for monitoring for recurrence? And uh, do we recommend regular CTs? Um, yeah, so if, if the, most often if the tumor markers were elevated before the surgery, they are, can be a good marker for recurrence. So not 100%, but very reasonable. And if you're already 11 years out from surgery and haven't had a recurrence and just being followed by tumor markers, I actually think that would be, that'd be fine. Like I would be very comfortable with that. Um, looks like there's, um, so uh, we're very close to the end of the time. I do want to um, give uh, uh, Reverend Cooper an opportunity to uh, just kind of share some of his experience and the role, and maybe just share with us even what the role of chaplaincy is um, here at, at the Huntsman and, um, and, and whatever thoughts you have and kind of wrap it up for us. <laughs> All right. I'll, 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 I'll try to be concise. I think um... So the role of, uh, I'll start with the role of chaplaincy and then actually um, the exchange, Mark, thank you very much for your answer in chat because I think that illustrates a few things actually. Um, so first of all, we see spirituality and religion as interconnected, but not as the same thing. Um, religion is about community belief and um, shared practice. 
So religious engagement involves being part of a community, sharing beliefs with people, and sharing rituals and practices with people. Um, <clears throat> whereas spirituality is more about your sense of meaning, purpose, and sense of connection to the larger world. So spirituality is more about the why you personally have for what, what's important to you and why you are willing to do certain things and why you're motivated. Um, I noticed as Mark and Trisha were talking that there were some surprises, some surprises for them in their course of care and in their recovery. Um, and that is not uncommon. That's what most patients find because healthcare in this hospital is kind of its own little world. And until they need to come here, most people don't have a huge amount of exposure to it. And so there are usually surprises and changes. And, you know, as, as Mark said, um, he expected that there'd be headwinds and setbacks. And that expectation is probably pretty important to people's motivation, you know, understanding that they're going to feel demotivated sometimes, that they're going to feel like they got their feet knocked out from under them on this journey sometimes, that there's going to be a surprise at some point during the care that makes them go, oh, geez, why did I even do this? You know, um, and then how do we how do we make our way through those? Um and everybody has their own unique way of doing that. You know, we all have our own sense of meaning, purpose, and connection that drives us and keeps us going. For some, for some folks, you know, pictures of the kids all over the wall help them on those days where they're feeling like not getting up and doing the therapy that helps them recover more quickly. Um, for others, it's thinking about getting back to work. And for some, um, it's hard for them to conceptualize what life looks like on the other side of cancer treatment. And when you're missing that kind of faith for the future, it's very hard to stay motivated. That's just a human reality. So, um, so that's the role of chaplaincy in cancer care is for us to kind of come alongside people um, and touch base on where their motivation comes from. What is it that's motivating them? And what is it that helps them cope with everything they're going through? And is that working out for them, right? For some people, they experience a crisis of belief as part of this because they have certain expectations their whole life as part of their religious engagement that then don't play out as part of their cancer treatment. And that can be very uprooting. And so, you know, chaplains on the religious side, we're here to help people have access to their clergy and their rituals and so forth when they're in the hospital. On the spiritual side, we're here to help people evaluate their sense of connection, meaning, and purpose, and, you know, try to shore that up and help them when that needs to change in some way as part of what they're going through. Um, and I think I want to go back to very quickly to a question about distance support in case those folks are already listening, right, or, or still here. Um, one of the surprising ironies of existence is that even when we humans think that talking about our emotions and how we feel and what it's like to go through something won't help us. Talking about our emotions and our feelings and what it's like for us to go through something helps us. <laughs> Even when we think it won't, that's what the research says. And so for those of you that are trying to support someone at distance, I wanted to add you know, to what Mark and Tricia said is, Give them listening room and, and not the kind of listening room that we have in social conversations where we share our stories and our challenges and, you know, we kind of go back and forth and stuff, but give them the kind of attentive listening space where they get to tell their story, their experience and how that's impacting them. And you tell them in, in your primary response is, thank you. I really wanted to hear that from you. And I'm really rooting for you. Like Mark, like Mark said, I'm really rooting for you. And I, anytime that you want to share what this is like, I'm here for you. And you can do that over any distance and it has a huge impact on people. I think that's it, right? You said we're close to time. We're Hopefully. Close to time, but thanks. Uh, I think we're a little over. So yeah, thanks, John. I think that was like the perfect way to uh, end the symposium. Uh, I, I think that, sort of that human element is, is what we're, you talk about what motivates us, right, is what, um, you know, spark, you know, 
it was a motivation for the symposium, right, to build this community, let people know, despite the rarity of this tumor, you're not alone. Um, others have, have gone through it, others have survived. Um, there's hope. Uh, we've got the ACPMP Research Foundation uh, supporting us all the way and really trying to, you know, to just champion the efforts uh, around this disease to, as Deborah said, you know, find a cure for everybody. So I think, Deborah, do you have any other uh, comments or? I don't. I just want to thank everyone for all that you're doing. And um, I just want to say, Reverend Cooper, thank you very much for, for your remarks. Very, very powerful and very poignant. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the panelists for joining us. I appreciate it. For the, for the guests, thank you for joining us. And uh, Deborah, thank you for everything and ACPMP. No, thank you. Okay. Nice weekend, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>